Holy and righteous Father, we thank you for the privilege of being your disciples. And Lord, the enemy comes in like a flood, especially when you say, okay, I'm going to walk on the narrow path. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. And by the power of your spirit, we are going to stay on this life fast. We are going to be fruitful, extremely fruitful. And we're going to continue to multiply because you've hedged us in, God. You've hedged us in, God. And we're going to take every thought captive. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you for writing on the tablets of our heart. We thank you for causing us to walk in your ways. We thank you, God. You said, let these words sink deep. And Lord, you said, it's not by might or power, but by your spirit. And Lord, our eyes are on you this morning. Take us by the hand, God, and just lead us into the fullness of everything that you have for us. Lord, be a wall of fire around us today in a day of vengeance against our enemy. Lord, we ask that you forgive all of our sins, known and unknown, even the blind spots, God. Lord, open up, shine light on the blind spots that we can walk in the wholeness and healing of everything you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So we're in Mark 5. Let's read. Let's read 21 through 43. When when Jesus had crossed over again on the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him and he stayed by the seashore. And one of the synagogue officials named Jairus came and upon seeing him fell at his feet and pleaded with him earnestly, saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. And he went off with him, and a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. A woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hand of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but instead had become worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. For she had been saying to herself, if I just touch his garments... I will get well. And immediately the flow of blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had from, from him had gone out, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him, told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be cured of your disease. <clears throat> While he was speaking, people came from the house of the synagogue official saying, your daughter has died. Why bother the teacher further? But Jesus, overhearing what was being spoken, said to the synagogue official, do not be afraid, only believe. And he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the synagogue official, and they saw a commotion and people loudly weeping and wailing. And after entering, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child has not died, but is asleep. And they began laughing at him, but putting them all aside, he took the child's father and mother and his own companions and entered the room where the child was in bed. And taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Tabitha, Talitha, whom, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old, and immediately they were completely astonished. And he gave them strict orders that no one was to know about this, and he told them to have someone, uh, have something given to her to eat. Okay, so as you can see, it's all about him and it's all about them, him and them. So the synagogue official, just look at his posture in verse 22, just falls at his feet, falls at his feet, a posture of worship, begging him in verse 23, said, my daughter's at the point of death, come lay your hand on her. And you wonder about this synagogue official verse 22 was he a pharisee 
Was he a follower? See what I mean? A synagogue official. It sounds like he's, you know, could have been part of the religious sect. And it says he went off with him and a large crowd following him. And the woman, this is uh, this woman who had the hemorrhage and imagine having a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians. Look at 26. Do you know how many times I meet people in this kind of condition? Spent everything tried every kind of antidote, um, spent everything. She just kept getting worse. And I really want to tell you about a lady named Mary. And she was in one of the trailer parks I met in Atlanta. When you go into Publix or Kroger or Albertsons, they would give us food that was getting ready to expire, bread. It's, it's called day old bread or two days old. It had like one day left. Cheesecakes, all the desserts. It didn't matter. Those big expensive desserts, the day before they expired, they would donate them. So we would go in the trailer park and this woman was very poor. And we would give her what you would call junk food. Cheesecakes, bread. Just, she told me, she said she had three cancers in her body. And the doctors told her that there's just no way, there's nothing that she could do. And so as I used to drop by her place, I'd say, Mary, I serve the Lord and three cancers to the Lord. That means nothing to the Lord. I said, he can heal you. And so we form in a circle. I can't remember who else was with her. They were, another guy was there that was a little touched, you know, not quite right? And somebody else, but we would form this circle and we would pray. And then one day she told me, she said, the doctors thought the cancers inside of her was shrinking. And then she told me they bought a new machine. They thought there was something wrong with their machine. And then the last time I went there, she was laughing. She said, they want me to write down everything I'm eating. <laughs> Cheesecakes, bread. She said, because they can't believe the cancer's going away. I said, this is your opportunity to tell them about Jesus. He was doing a miracle in front of the doctors. I remember laughing so hard when she told me they bought a new machine. And then three cancers. I mean, this woman that they really told her there's nothing she could do. They really didn't even want her back. Now they wanted her in the office. Can you come in? Can you come in? Write down everything you're eating. What are you doing? I'm eating cheesecakes and Twinkies and loaves of bread. <laughs> it kind of reminds me of this place because she was at a place where three cancers, there's nothing they can do. And then we prayed. There's always something we can do. We can pray. There's never a place where it's a dead end street with our God. Never. It's, there's never a case. There's never a disease. There's never a demon that's a dead end for our God. Our God is able. He's willing. I am willing. I am willing. I am willing. And so what happened, she, this woman had endured much, spent all she had. Nobody could help. She just got worse, 12 years of suffering. She heard about Jesus and she came up behind the crowd. Could you imagine, put yourself in this woman's place. All your money's gone, 12 years of misery. You keep hemorrhaging. You see the healer and you're just trying to work your way. You just want one touch. You just want to work your way through the crowd. If you can just lay hands, just touch this man, you believe you're going to get your healing. I mean, could you imagine just pushing your way through all this crowd and you're hemorrhaging, you're bleeding, you've been, you know, your money's gone. You're, you're, you're at the end. And it says she just touched his garment. And she said, if I just touch him, just one touch. And you know what? I pray that we can all have this attitude and it doesn't take us 12 years 
running out of all money and hemorrhaging for 12 years to get to this yeah. place. Just one touch, just one touch, God, just moving through the crowd, moving through the heavens. God, we just need one touch. Just one touch is going to change everything. Come on, this woman, if I just touch him, everything's going to be changed. And that should be our attitude. God, we just need that touch from you. Not just once in a while. We need it every day. Vivian, listen to this. She was like breaking through the crowd. It says, I want you to tell, I want you to understand this. The crowd's in front of you. The cure is Jesus. You, you, you dig your way through, fight your way through, pray your way through, get through the crowd. And what does the crowd represent? The, the world. Noise. Huh? The mass. The noise of the world. The noise of the world. You got it, Scott. Here's all the noise of the world. And I've got to break through it. I've got to break through the noise of the world. I got to break through the crowd of my own desires. Remember, we read about the seed and the sire, the desires for more things and the desires for more wealth. I got to break through that crowd. I got to break through that crowd of lust, the crowd of the world. Like, like Scott said, that was good revelation. I got to break through and if I just get a touch from him, I'm good. Everything's going to be okay. I'm going to be made well. And so in immediately, look at this. As soon as you get into that posture, breaking through, well, you can't go through these heavens. They're brass. Oh yeah. You can't go through these heavens. There's principalities over the city. There's this, there's that. Well, I'm going to break through because I need a touch. I'm breaking through. That's got to be our attitude. We're coming for you, Jesus. You know why? He said, if you draw close to me, I'm coming for you. That's a promise. It's written. Draw close to me and I'll draw <laughs> close to you. So you start going. I'm coming. I'm, I'm, I've got to have this touch, Lord. He's coming closer to you. And I believe he loves it when we just shake it off and say, I'm coming through the crowd. I'm coming through these things in the world. I am going to break through. I'm coming for you, God, and you promised you're coming for me. And look what happened. Immediately, she just touched the garment, broke through the crowd, touched the garment, and immediately she felt she was healed. That's power. Just that touch, God, everything's going to be okay. I mean, you might be on your knees. You might be worshiping. You might be weeping. You might just be laying on your face. I got to have the touch. I have got to have the breakthrough. And all of a sudden that flood of peace come over you. And you're like, wow, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And immediately Jesus, he could, he felt the power proceeding from him. He said, who touched my garments? And the di disciple says, look at this big crowd. He says, what do you mean who touched you? You know, they're in their head. And he looked around to see the woman. And the woman was full of fear and trembling and aware of the miracle that she got. So it makes me feel that the woman didn't really know him because she's fearing, she's trembling. She, it's, it's almost like her stolen miracle or something. She came down and she fell before him, that posture of worship. She tells him the whole truth. And look what he says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Isn't that beautiful? That's a, that's a prescription. Let's break through the crowd. You got an affliction? Let's break through the crowd. Matt. Can I, um, <clears throat> when, when I was like choosing the Lord, I said, I kept talking about how I've chosen the Lord and you, and you said he chose me, which I really appreciated. 
it's a it's a kind of a mystery to me. I mean, it's not that mysterious, but it's amazing to me. And anyway, this um, this woman, he says to her, "Your faith has healed you." And I just still feel like, you know, the Lord has the power, but it's our faith. Like I feel so that I feel that I have power through my faith. Obviously that power is, comes from him. Um, but he just says your faith healed you almost. Of course he healed her. It's just semantics. But anyway, I just want to pray that, you know, we have this faith. Like I, that God just give me this faith. That's just this, in, this uh, study this morning is so inspiring. So I just want to pray and just thank God for this faith. Thank God for this amazing Bible study and ask God that he just give us that touch today and, Give us that just inspiration. I just already thank you for being touched. And thank you that being in the word is so um, such a strong touch from you, Lord. And just I just pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And, you know, Amen. when Matt was uh, talking, I almost thought he was going to ask me a question. What does faith look like? And this is such an example of what faith looks like. I'm going to break through the crowd and I'm going to get a touch from this king. That's faith. First of all, I believe he's here. Second of all, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to break through the crowd of busyness. I'm going to break through the crowd of the world and I'm going to sit here at his feet. I'm going to <clears throat> praise him. I'm going to pray to him. I'm going to worship him until I feel that flood of peace. And, the, and that's really, this is a great picture of what faith looks like. If I can only get a touch, I'll be healed. Uh, Christy. Well, she touched the hem of his garment, right? So yes. That is, is a, as a seamstress, that's the last thing you do. It's like the finishing touch, the finisher the that i think that there's a parable in there you know oh that, um, yeah wow um, as far as the, it's the hem so that's the last thing that's done it's the final touch is yeah. the completion and huh. you know what christy that's wow god's given you really good revelation on that because she had to go through 12 years of running to and fro being storm tossed here mm. there Loss of money, loss of money, loss of money, loss of money. Nothing was working. She had to get to that place where if I don't get a touch from this healer, this man, Christ, I, it's, it's not going to happen. And, and look at that. She, she was, you're right. The him is the last step. She had already lost. Everything else was over. The doctors couldn't do it. Nothing worked for her. Till she got to that last step, I'm going to come to the Lord. And that's what I said this last season. It was everything first and then God. And I'm asking God, flip our worlds upside down. God, it's you first and then him and them, him and them, him and them, him first. Yes. It says that when she heard about Jesus, she came to him and said, so then he had told her that your faith made you whole. And Romans 10, 17 tells us, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So it's that spending time with him and knowing who he is, is where our faith gets built up. Amen. Amen. Hearing the word. But I, I, I also feel this is, she might not have even went out of her house if she still had a lot of money and a lot of prescriptions. You know, she's hearing about him, but the Bible lets us know that she had grown worse. And look at this, 26. She endured much at the hands of many physicians, spent everything she had and was not helped. And then here comes hearing the good news. What is she hearing, Joyce? The good news of the gospel. Amen. Amen. Jesus. Jesus. Amen. The, the fact that she touched the hem of his garment meant that she was crawling through the crowd. She had to be on the Ooh. ground to touch the very bottom of his garment. She humbled herself 
She pressed through the crowd. How many people did she touch? Okay, they would have stoned her. But she she humbled herself and her faith took her to where she needed to be and how she needed to do it. Yeah, yeah. She was definitely in that worship position, just crawling through that crowd, getting to the hem of his garment. Wow, a lot going on there. Daughter, your faith has made you well. And I just want to encourage all of you today, don't give up. Don't stop in the middle of the mountain. Remember when my son was in a wheelchair and he had no control over his body. It was like spaghetti. And the Lord said to me, don't stop in the middle of the mountain. And I was just totally like, whoa, am I being ripped off by the devil, God? Why are you telling me don't stop in the middle of the mountain? And I'm pushing my son around. God had already raised him from the dead. And I'm pushing him around like a piece of spaghetti in the hospital. And God's saying, don't stop in the middle of the mountain. And finally, these young men walk in. My son says, mom, I, I have to go to the bathroom. I say to these young men, will you walk my son to the bathroom? And my son looked at me and says, mama, can I walk? In the name of Jesus, you can walk. It was like a cartoon. He shot right out of that wheelchair. And two weeks later, we walked out of the hospital. Don't stop in the middle of the mountain. I'm saying that to somebody today who has feels, can identify with this woman who has endured much at the hands of the physician. Don't, don't stop. Just keep pushing. Keep believing. Because the heaven's going to open and you're going to touch the garment of the Lord. Absolutely. Amen. There's somebody that's exhausted in the run. And the Lord is saying, come on, come on. I'll meet you in the middle. You draw close to me and I'll draw. You draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. James 4, 8. Robin, put it up there for us. Karen, the interesting thing about that scripture is just what we're talking about. The rest of the scripture says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So mm -hmm. we're, we're back to where we were at the very beginning. Right, right. Um, that's one thing we could probably, we could probably get time to pray for right now, double-minded. And that's, you know, just being storm tossed. And you want to pray that, uh, Robin, for everybody that the Lord would take away the double mindedness. Father God, we come before you, Lord Jesus. And Father, we know, Lord, that your word is forever. Yes. And amen. You are the same yesterday, today, tomorrow and forever, Father God. And we can fully rely on you, Lord Jesus. And so, Father, I'm asking for all of us, God, that that encounter like we get, we kind of get weak and we start reaching out for other options, Father God. I pray, Lord, that you alert us on that, that we catch those thoughts captive and we get on our face before you, Father God. And we take those healing scriptures, Father God, because, Lord, you are the great physician and all the other physicians they may mean well, they do, they do what they can, Father God, but we have the authority to go to the highest, the very highest in the third heaven, Father God, and sit with you in the heavenly places, Father God, and we are already healed, Father God. You have finished the work. It is completed, Father God, for eternity, Father, and we can rely and hold on to that. So, Father, I pray for all of us, Lord, that you cleanse our minds, Father God, and especially our words, Father, that we would not come into agreement with the enemy in Jesus' name. And looking that up, double-minded, it, it means having, uh, doubting, uncertain, wavering, divided in interest. Half your interest is on the kingdom, the other half is on the crowd in the world. And then the strong says two-spirited, two-spirited, double-minded, double-minded in purpose. One front for the kingdom, the other front for his enemy. 
And Lord, we repent for being double-minded, all of us, God. Wash us in the blood of Jesus, and thank you for exposing that, God. Uh, the double-mindedness, having two spirits. Lord, there's only one spirit to dwell in us, and that's the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Christ that dwells in our heart by faith. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you for healing, healing your people of double-mindedness in Jesus' name, <clears throat> a mighty deliverance in Jesus' name. Amen. And I think that was part of that last season residue, double-mindedness. He's got the woman. It's, it's amazing. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. That's why I said break through the crowd, pray, worship, talk to God till you've got the peace, till you, till, till you know all is well. And then he's still speaking. And here comes the synagogue official. He's at the house and they're telling him another official, your daughter's died. Why trouble the teacher? It's over. And that, what did I just say a few minutes ago? It's never over with God. It's never over with God. Really? It's over with the world. It's over with the doctors. It's over with everyone else, but it's never over with God. And Jesus overhearing said, don't be, he tells the man that he's with, he said, don't be afraid any longer. Get rid of your fear. I want you to believe. That's what he's saying. Stop fearing and just believe. And then he, he runs everyone out and he saw the commotion. He said, why make a commotion? The child's not dead, just sleeping. And that's like the righteous, just asleep. And they're laughing at him. He puts them all out. He takes the child by the hand. Talitha Kum, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl got up, began to walk. She was 12 years old, and they were completely astounded. The power of God, amazement. It's never over, never over, never over with God. Whatever, look at all these healings that we've been reading about. Demons going out, madness of mind. What is he telling us? He's saying, just keep your hands out of the way. Keep your Hippocrates little purse out of the way. Let me do the miracle. And even though he uses your hands, he doesn't want your uh, world knowledge interfering with what he's doing. So that's what he says. He says, keep it out of the way. I'm going to do miracles. And he's showing us, he said, the word, just sow the word. I sent the word to heal the people. And then here we are in chapter five, you can see that no matter how bad the person is, I mean, 2000 demons, even they couldn't keep him chained, shackled. They, they you know, the, the town thought he was hopeless and the Lord healed him. So it doesn't matter what the condition the Lord's telling us, the little girl dead. And he says, she's not a dead, she's asleep. Get up, you know, taking her by the hand. So he's showing us whatever your situation is, he's hope to the hopeless. He, he's a way of the truth and the life. He's the good news. Jesus Christ is the good news of the gospel. He is the eternal gospel. And so I feel that all of through here, He's telling us that he's the good news, whatever your situation is. Jesus went out from there and then came into his hometown and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. And the many listeners were astonished saying, where did this man learn these things? And where did this wisdom, and what is this wisdom that has been given to him? And such miracles as these performed by his hands. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are his sisters not here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not dishonored except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. 
And he could not do any miracle there except that he had laid his hands on a few people and healed them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. And he was going around the villages teaching. And he summoned the, the, the 12 and began to send them out in pairs and giving them authority over unclean spirits. And he instructed them that they were to take nothing for their journey except a mere staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belt, but to wear sandals. And he added, do not wear two tunics. And he said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you have to leave town. Any place that does not receive you or listen to you as you go out from there, shake the dust off the soles of your feet as a testimony against them. And they went out and preached that people are to repent and they are were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil and many and many sick people. Wait, and they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. In verse 1, his disciples followed him. This is the favor of God. It's the favor of God on our lives that we're gathered together every morning. This is favor. This is what favor is, that he will pour out his revelation, that he will share with us. And he's going to begin showing us things to come, his plans. He's definitely opening our heart that we can just be filled with everything, every purpose, everything that he has preordained for us to walk in before the foundation of the world. So he has us together as his disciples. And people, he's doing miracles and the people around are like, wait a minute, I used to know this person. I used to know this person, Carol. I used to know this person, Scott. What's going on? Where is he getting these this wisdom? What about all these miracles that are happening around this person? What's going on? Where is he getting this? It's coming from above. But the people are scratching their head like, wait a minute. I He used to be a carpenter. When they saw me on TV, she used to, you know, sit and close the bars. You know, she was a nothing. What is she doing preaching? Wait, wait a minute. Who is, what, what's going on with this person? And that's what people are going to say when the anointing and the power and you're standing there raised up in the gospel, raised up in the call of God on your life. And they're saying, is not this the carpenter? What is he doing a miracle for? Doesn't he work on kitchen cabinets? What is he doing raising that dead person? Where did he get this power from? What, what's going on? Why is that guy going around healing people? I thought he did kitchens. You see what I mean? The, the power of God just coming down in Christ himself. A carpenter, isn't, wasn't he, isn't he a carpenter? What's he doing healing all these people? Where is the wisdom coming from that he's speaking in all this parabolic language? God can do anything. Listen, I've been in the darkest Islamic refugee camp area and saw God do a miracle. A, a little boy born deaf and mute and he opens his ears and his, loosens his tongue. So God can do anything, but it says he wondered at their unbelief. And it, here in verse seven, he summoned the 12 and he sent them out in twos and he gave them authority over the unclean spirit. All of us have authority over the unclean spirit. Okay. Now, if so, if your neighbor needs prayer, and you don't have somebody there in the neighborhood to come pray, don't tell your neighborhood, I have to wait, I can only go out in twos. I mean, don't don't stumble. Don't be a stumbling block. If your neighbor needs prayer, go pray for him. And God will stand there with you. Christ will stand right there with you and do the miracle. He summoned the 12. He gave them authority over unclean spirits. And they And look at this. In verse 8, don't be doing any money changing on your mission. Don't be trying to fill your pocket or your checking account. I'm giving you a mission. I'm giving you a mission to go out. Look at that. I don't want you taking bread, a bag. I don't even want you taking any money. He said, make this about me. 
Make it about me, says the Lord. Just wear sandals and don't even take two jackets. He entered a house, okay? And then he says, if they won't listen to you, shake the dust off soles of your feet for a testimony against them. But he went out and a lot of people stay right here. I mean, they actually brag on testimonies of being able to shake the dust off their feet rather than bragging on the miraculous of what God does. I think sometimes this is, our heart is like totally in the wrong spot. It's, he says, go out. What did he say? Do first before you shake the dust off your feet. What does he say to do first? Tell them they need to repent. You need to repent. You know, the fire's coming. You need to repent. You need to get right with God. And what did Paul talks later about pleading, pleading with people, imploring people, pleading with them to get their life right. And so they went out and they preached repentance. So what's happening in 12 and 13? They're preaching the eternal gospel. They're preaching the good news of the gospel. And what happens? What did God say? Signs, wonders, and miracles follow the preaching of the word. Word. Are they, are they talking about the measurements right here of the temple? Are they talking about what color the garments were on, on top of the temple? You know, the cloth, the, the goat skin. You know, those things are wonderful to read about. But right here, they are totally focused on the good news of the gospel. And why that's so important is because in Revelation, he's going to send out three angels. And what is the angel in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6? I sent out another angel flying in mid heaven having an eternal gospel to preach who live on the earth to every nation, tribe, and tongue. So in Revelation, God's going to send out an angel, get the job done, and they're going to be preaching the eternal gospel, the good news of the gospel. So this is what, they're very focused on what they're preaching. They're staying in their lane, okay? They're preaching repentance. The kingdom of heaven is near. They're casting out demons. They're anointing with oil the sick people and they're healing them. Power. Those are our marching orders, 12 and 13. Preach repentance. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Cast out the demons and heal the sick. It's, it's wonderful swimming in the word of God. It's wonderful the mysteries of God and learning secrets and the beautiful color of the gates of heaven and the pearls and all these kind of things. But when you go out there in that lost and dying world, you don't have a lot of time, people. They might have to wait till they get to heaven to see the big pearl in every gate. It's, it's wonderful to know these things. I love swimming in the word of God. But when he sent them out, he said, preach the good news of the gospel. Let's get the job done. And I feel we need to get in our lane, pick up the mandate of heaven and get the job done. And don't get me wrong. I love reading, you know, the, the different facts and how many tribes there are and how many men in each tribe and who is the head of the house. But he said, go out, tell them to repent, preach the good news of the gospel, heal the sick and raise the dead. Talk about my blood, you know, the way back home. That's what he's saying. Uh, Laura. Yeah, I just wanted to say um, when we, I mean, I heard people when, when they pray, sometimes casting out demons or just uh, praying against those things with somebody. You know, sometimes we forget that they need to get salvation first, right? It's when you find, let's say you find a stranger, you find someone that needs some prayer. And, you know, we don't cast out the demon without even asking him if he knows the Lord. Is that right? That would be well, like the order. I mean, I've seen people lost, 
have demons cast out and God do a miracle with them. What God's trying to tell us here is preach repentance, preach the, don't go out there and try to do a miracle without preaching the good news of the gospel. The order God's telling us, <laughs> preach. But I have seen, okay, say you're at a conference, Laura, and you're, you're preaching or say you're just in a household and you're speaking about the Lord. Now you're praying for the sick. I mean, I have seen people like even the little Muslim child in their family, they got miracles. I mean, I seen quite a few miracles in the refugee camp of people and they really, they knew the Lord was giving them the miracle, but they really, it, the miracles weren't just for the holy or the righteous or the repented or, you know, those that claim to be righteous. The miracles, when you're out there and God does a miracle, a lot of times, you know, you're preaching. What is this? This is Jesus Christ. A lot of times in the miracle, we'll see in the gospel, they're explaining who it is that just did the miracle. And it brings in the opportunity to preach the gospel. Because remember, he came for the sinners. But he is showing us an order here. Preach the gospel, preach repentance. I, I mean, I've talked to people, they say, well, no, I've, I, I've never asked Jesus to forgive me my sins. Why? Why would I do that? It, it, it is the process of becoming a child of God, asking the Lord to forgive you your sins. It, they went out and preached repentance. Paul prayed, may a door of repentance open. But the only reason I said that, Laura, is don't put him in a box. He, you know, some Islamic or Buddhist could be sitting there. The power of God could hit him and they get a miracle. And that opens the door for you to preach Jesus. I mean, it, it's God. Just like he said, don't lay hands on the ark. But he's giving a good order. He's Remember, the, the, he's sending them out in twos. Who are they? They're disciples. Here's your opportunity, guys. We're going to send you out in twos. And you're going to preach repentance. You're going to cast out demons. Anoint the sick people with oil and heal them all. I mean, that's great. He's giving them order. But if the Spirit of God falls on, on somebody that walks up to the meeting and hadn't heard the whole preaching. I mean, the spirit of God's the spirit of God. He's, he, I've seen him fall on the dead and the living. And he's definitely not just for those that are in the kingdom. I mean, he'll do miracles all over with the dead that you have an opportunity to preach repentance in the kingdom of God. Oh, I just, I just wanted to pray for spiritual maturity and discipline, because I know that spiritual warfare requires more than just assignment of authority and to be effective. And um, I just, I just want to pray for and repent for all sins known and unknown. And thank you for giving us the authority over the power of the enemy. Amen. In Mark sixteen twenty, it says they went out and they're preaching everywhere, and the Lord is confirming the gospel confirming the word by doing signs and wonders and miracles so they're in order they're trying to keep the order they're preaching uh the good news of the gospel he's doing signs wonders and miracles but in they're putting oil anointing the sick and the sick are being healed but i want you all to know it doesn't always work like that. Sometimes the spirit of God will fall. Someone will get up and scream. I can see, I can hear. I mean, things happen, but it's always opportunity for repentance and the good news of the gospel. And Chris, Christy's right. Um, Christy, you felt our, our heads were in the way of the miracles of God. Remember what the Lord, um, Jeremiah 23, it says in the last days, you're going to clearly understand what's going on. He said, these people are running and I haven't sent them. He said, if they would be in my presence, when they get out there, they're going to preach repentance. They're going to tell the people to come back to me. 
So the Lord said in the last days, you're going to clearly see this. If they're not telling you we need to repent for our sins, we need to come back to God. He, the Lord saying, I didn't send them. He says that in Jeremiah 23, 18 through 22. If they've stood in his counsel, they would announce his words. He's talking about his prophets. Um, a lot of times the pastors, I mean, they if they're standing in the presence of God, they're going to tell the people to quit sinning. They're going to tell the people to repent. And he said, in the last days, you're going to understand this. It says in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 20, in the last days, you'll clearly understand if I've sent them, they're preaching repentance. Holy and uh, righteous father, we thank you for sealing, sealing the word of God into our heart. We thank you for causing us to be fruitful and multiply. Lord, we're in it to win it. We're so thankful to you, God. And Lord, we thank you for forgiving all of our sins, known and unknown, and causing us to walk in your ways, God. Lord, energize us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let the life-giving spirit of Jesus Christ flow through us. And Lord, let us speak repentance, cast out demons, and heal the sick according to the word of God, where you follow God. You follow the preaching of the word with signs, wonders, and miracles. It is written. It is written. That's what happens. And I thank you for healing your disciples, God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Time is short.